These are amazing words that we come to today. That dead people hear a voice and come alive. The physically dead, the spiritually dead, come alive by hearing the voice of God. And often when we meet people, as we're walking through life, we ask that question, how are you doing? Which almost no one is ever honest in answering, are they? You know, but in the context of what we're looking at today, how shocking but also how fitting would it be to ask someone a more important question, a more direct question, how are you living today? Are you alive today? Are you alive? And we can imagine we get these strange looks back at us. What kind of question is that? Hopefully after today we're convinced that it's a good question. It's a biblical question. It's a question that our God asks. Are you alive? How do you know? And our God is full of these amazing, interesting questions, just as we have been going through the Gospel of John. Do you want to be well? Are you thirsty? Are you hungry? Do you want to see? Do you know that you need to be born again? Will you follow the Son of Man? Will you trust Him? Do you believe in the Son of God? Will you worship Him? And today comes this direct question from our text to us. Will you respond to His voice and live? Will you respond to His voice and live? And as we've been coming through the book of John, we see that really Jesus is on trial again and again among common folk, among even his own disciples, among his family, and among those who are in positions of authority, wondering, who is this guy? Who's this Jesus? And what do we do with him? And there's some people answering and responding positively to his voice, and there's some people that are shrugging it off, some people ignoring him, some people who wish his mouth could be nailed shut, and in the context of what we're looking at today, Jesus will say that he is deserving of honor. But what he meets again and again by people is dishonor and opposition. And it's fascinating that the gospel writer John doesn't shy away from recording that in his gospel. I don't know about you, but if I was making this stuff up, I would just delete those passages where people say, we want to kill Jesus. Or they can't figure out who he is. But it's right there in the text. And he comes across this opposition. And most pointedly, he comes at it from these religious authorities. And their judgment of Jesus is both ironic and sad, page after page. They want to kill Jesus. They want to kill the one who created them. They want to kill Jesus, who is the light of the world and the life of the world. And as they move further and further along to this frustration and hatred and murderous response to him, the whole time Jesus continues to hold out very graciously life to them, eternal life to them. They judge the Lord of the Sabbath for working on the Sabbath, and they totally miss how God never stops working to create and to heal. They peer into the law of God and they judge Jesus by it, all the while primarily missing what Scripture was there for to reveal and point to Jesus Christ and our need for Him. They judge His words, go take up your mat and walk. And they miss out on the word of God who is revealing and giving life through his voice. The one who is standing in front of them, speaking to them. Later in this chapter, they will say that they admire Moses, but Moses will judge them for trying to make Scripture a means in itself to save themselves instead of letting it lead them to Christ. So again and again in the book of John, in this gospel, this book of good news, we come across really two options to life and no more. The first option is those 
who approach Jesus are drawn by him or the ones that he approaches, and they are healed. And they are restored to eternal life because they believe he is who he says he is. And there is only one other category, those who stay away from him who draw back into the shadows of life, into darkness, and they remain in unbelief. And instead of receiving life, they plunge themselves into death. There are dead people who hear Jesus' voice and they live. There are people who look alive and they reject Jesus' voice and they will die. So the great question surrounding this chapter and the book of John and human life is, who is Jesus Christ? Who is he? And how do we respond to him? That question was troubling to ancient people. It is troubling today to postmodern people. It has never been not troubling of what we do with Jesus Christ. There are cults and religions that have existed and do exist today that promote a diminished Jesus Christ, a diminished one, that he is less than God. They propose that he is an angel, or maybe a prophet, or a teacher, or he is anointed, and may be gifted as a human being, but he is not God. And this is what we're coming to in this text today. You know, there's lots of passages that I think preach very well. I came to this passage as we're just trying to faithfully walk through the book of John, and you go, what do we do with this? This sounds heavy. But I promise you, actually, I think this is a wonderful piece of Scripture that we're going to look at because it simply tells us the answer to that question directly, who is Jesus? And I don't know about you, but when I come to Scripture, my heart always revolts and responds, okay, okay, but tell me, tell me, what do I do with this? What's the application? I need five things to fix my marriage this week. I need ten things to give me life. I need seven things that will give me a better week. But I have to slow down and say, here is the great application to all life. Who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? And how do I respond to that? There is this myth that what we will read in the Gospel of John was somehow made up hundreds of years later by people who wanted to consolidate their power and run a church. That they made a myth and made a legend of Jesus as God. And there's some popular cultural myth that we have that all these documents were doctored and added to. Something that entered in our popular conscious with things like the Da Vinci Code. It's not scholarly, it's actually a ridiculous statement. But just one proof of that that I want to point out and draw to us as we come to this question of who is Jesus is a very old sermon by Melito, who is the Bishop of Sardis, which is in what would be today Western Turkey. And he gave this message at the Passover time, preached about 180 A.D. Not long enough for myths and legends to be created. 145 years before Nicaea and the Creed and people supposedly deciding about making Jesus into a god. 130 years before Constantine's battle and declaring Christianity the religion of Rome. In short, long before the church had any power or prestige. And these words are words from a preacher who said things because this is all he knew and believed that was revealed and passed on to him by eyewitnesses. And this is what he says. And so he was lifted upon a tree and an inscription was attached indicating who was being killed. Who was it? It's a grievous thing to tell, but a most fearful thing to refrain from telling. But listen, as you tremble before him on whose account the earth trembled. He who hung the earth in place is hanged. He who fixed the heavens in place is fixed in place. He who made all things fast is made fast on a tree. The sovereign is insulted. God is murdered. The king of Israel is destroyed by an Israelite hand. 
This is the one who made the heavens and the earth and formed mankind in the beginning, the one proclaimed by the law and the prophets, the one enfleshed in a virgin, the one hanged on a cross, the one buried in the earth, the one raised from the dead and who went up to the heights of heaven, the one sitting at the right hand of the Father, the one having all authority to judge and to save, through whom the Father made the things which exist from the beginning of time. This one is the beginning and the end, the beginning indescribable and the end incomprehensible. This one is the Christ. This one is the King. This one is Jesus. This one is the leader. This one is the Lord. This one is the one who rose from the dead. This one is the one sitting at the right hand of the Father. To him be the glory and the power forever. Amen. This was the Christ, the biblical Christ, the real Christ that has always been faithfully preached. I pray that God will faithfully preach his word here today. Those are amazing words. Those are powerful words because they are true. But even better words than those are turning to Jesus to hear his own words. And so as we open our Bibles to John chapter 5, let's pray. Lord, we come today as your people, to hear your word. We want to hear your voice. We want to see you as you chose to reveal yourself. Lord, we pray for those who do not know you here today, that they will hear your voice and be drawn to receive life eternal in you, Jesus. For those who know you, Jesus, and have put their faith in you, our prayer is that we will know you more. And that at knowing you more, as you chose to reveal yourself, we can follow you all the more better. We can serve you and worship you all the more truer. Lord, make yourself known to your people today. We pray in your precious name. Amen. So let's read in John chapter 5. We'll pick up in verse 18. And we'll read through verse 29. So starting in verse 18, chapter 5. This was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own Father, making himself equal with God. So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he himself is doing. And greater works than these will he show him, so that you may marvel. For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. For the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He who does not come, in, he does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God. And those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. As we come here to the Word of God, there is a, there is a great tension about those people who are standing right in front of Jesus. They have attacked him because he has done a healing miracle on the Sabbath. And they want to know by what authority 
can you say these kinds of things? By what authority can you do these kind of things? By what authority can you tell someone to break our laws? And that's what's at, at stake here. And they understand his response from verse 18 that he has made himself equal with the Father. That he has called him Father in a way that no human being can. And has made himself equal in saying that he is Lord of the Sabbath. And this is the great tension here. They recognize that Jesus is claiming deity, divinity. And for this, they want to kill him. And all of that tension and drama surrounding them, judging him and looking upon him, it leads to these revealing verses that we just looked at. Verses in which we learn so much about the Son. And he shares these things with us. He reveals to them his sonship. What does it mean that he is the Son of God in relation to God the Father? He tells people also about his unique lordship, especially over life and death. And then he talks about the kind of relationship that he uses the language of those who hear the word of God. And so the first thing is that he talks about his sonship, his sonship, that he was making a claim that he is the Son of God. This is something that is important, his first claim, answering them about who he is. We notice that there's a question surrounding the Sabbath and what you can do and what you can't do on this day, what was written in the law and what has been added to it. But Jesus doesn't get into a debate about what is actually permissible on the Sabbath. He doesn't go into a theological discussion on that they don't really understand the Sabbath. What he seems most interested in is they know who he is. And he answers them very graciously by revealing, these people who are judging him, he's revealing by what authority he can do these things. He can do them because he is the Son. Now here's a basic Bible tip as you read Scripture. If a word gets repeated a lot, it's probably important. So underline it or highlight it. In this, in this small section, I counted the word son ten times. Something important. He wants to tell us about what it means to be the son, the son of man, the son of God. As we come to understand Jesus' sonship, we have to zoom out for just a little bit and really ask a question about what it means that God is a Trinitarian God, that God is three persons in one being, what we can say is the Trinity. Because a lot of the cults and the false religions that come to this particular passage mess this up by misunderstanding. What Christianity is not is not tritheism. Tritheism is that there are three gods. We don't believe in three gods. Christianity is not modalism. Modalism is a false teaching that there are three persons, but never at the same time. God the Father turned into God the Son. God the Son turned into the Holy Spirit in this time. But that's not the Christianity that has always been revealed from Scripture. When we talk about the Trinity, it is, it is mind-blowing. It is something that is hard to grasp, but it is something that God has given us in Scripture. And so we must wrestle with this, particularly in understanding Jesus' relationship with the Father and what that means. Some big words that are useful to us is understanding the Trinity along two lines. There's the ontological and there's the economic. Ontological means being. Study ontology means the study of being. What we mean by the ontological trinity is we are referring to the fact that God is three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in one being. In one being. There are three persons in the Godhead who together are one being. So the ontological trinity structure of the trinity is unity that there is one being unified with three persons as americans it's something we understand e pluribus unum we are many and yet we are one 
in God, there are three persons, and yet he is one being. When we speak of the economic trinity, what we're saying is this one being God has three persons who are co-equal in divinity, co-equal in deserving worship, co-equal in power and in glory and in holiness, but they are differentiated by different roles that they do. Now, this really helps me understand this because the Trinity in Scripture is never talked about just in abstract terms. I know it sounds a little abstract right now, but it's always talked about in very practical terms. If you think about this, the way that the Trinity is revealed to us in salvation, in salvation, we have a better understanding about this economic model of the Trinity. It is the Father who sends the Son into the world for our redemption. We read that in John 3.16. The Father so loved the world that he sent his Son. But it's not the Father who dies on the cross for us. It is the Son who acquires our redemption for us. The Father sins, the Son obeys and dies, and it is the Holy Spirit who then applies redemption to our lives. So just in the idea of salvation Three beings in one God have three different distinct roles. So in Orthodox Christianity, we can say that the Son is equal to the Father in power, in glory, and in being. They are both equally God. But from all eternity, the Father has planned to send the Son. The Son does not send the Father. So even though the Son and the Father are equal in power, glory, and being, there is what we see a subordination of the Son to the Father. That doesn't mean He's less than the Father. It means that He has willfully subordinated in a role to God the Father. Jesus also did not become the Son at one point in time. Jesus has always been the Son, the second person of the Trinity. He's always been the Son of God. God didn't start relating as Father and Son when Jesus was born in that manger in Bethlehem. But they have eternally related to each other as Father and Son. It has always been and always will be to the glory of God. And so what we see is the Father has this unique relationship with the Son, and it's marked out by these three things. This is equality, and there's also unity and intimacy. With equality, what Jesus is revealing to us when they ask about his authority, how can you say these things? How can you do these things? Who are you? He reveals himself as the Son of God, and he gives term after term that proclaims to those who are hearing that he is God, that he is saying nothing less than claims of deity, one after the other. They've already been mad in verses 17 because he says he has always been working as the Father has been working. Verse 18, he was even calling God his own Father. Verse 19, the Son can do nothing of his own accord. Whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. In other words, whatever God the Father can do, God the Son can do also. When it comes to creating life, healing, giving sight, taking away disease, making food and water out of nothing, forgiving sins. This is why they want to kill him. They say, who are you that you say you can do these things? His answer is, I am equal with the God you call Yahweh and I call Father. Verses 22 and 27, it tells us that Jesus is claiming deity by saying that he is the judge. The Bible tells us that only Yahweh is able to judge. Only he has the justice. Only he has the righteousness. Only he has the mercy to judge mankind. But here Jesus is saying he too is a judge a righteous God judge. And we go on with these next verses as well. Verses 21, 25, and 28 tell us 
As the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. What is Jesus saying? I have the authority to do these things, say these things, because co-equal with God, I have the power of giving life, of raising people physically and spiritually out of sin, out of tombs, to restore life, all by his voice and by his prerogative, to whom he will, as he sees fit, that he is sovereign over life. And that we are to respond to his voice as the voice of God. The same God to his accusers who declared the law by his voice, giving it to prophets. Revealing himself through angels and through messengers and gave his voice and spoke to Moses. Jesus is standing before them with the same authority and the same power, co-equal with God, that they too must listen to his voice as the voice of God speaking to them. Verse 24 tells us, whoever hears my word and believes has eternal life. What Jesus is saying is that he holds the key to eternal life. Something that they have long looked for God to do, he says, that is me. And that eternal life is determined by being in covenant with Jesus, by believing in him, by believing in him. Just as Israel was saved by being covenant with Yahweh, so Jesus says all people, Samaritans, Gentiles, Jews, you receive eternal life through being in covenant with Jesus, by being in belief with him. And verse 26 tells us, for as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. What this means is that the Father and Son both have life in themselves that they have never been created. No one gave them life. There was not a time that the Son, Jesus Christ, never existed. He has always existed. This goes against the cults that say that there was one time Jesus was not, that he is a creature, maybe a glorified angel, maybe a demigod, but that's not what Scripture says. Scripture says that he has life in himself. No one had to give it to him. When it says the Father granted, he's saying that he made it honorable, he made it as possible, as so, not that he created Jesus Christ. He has life in himself. And then from understanding all of that about the equality of God, and as shocking as that is for his hearers to hear, Jesus keeps telling them about his, about his equality with God. But it's not only that Jesus is revealing his authority in that he is co-equal with God the Father, but that he is in unity with God the Father. Now for a moment, if your head isn't already spinning trying to think about the Trinity, it is logically possible that the Trinity could be three persons in one being, but those three persons disagree about a whole lot of stuff. It could be kind of a very unhappy marriage. What Jesus is saying here, what must be understood is that he's saying that's not how we operate. Many cults and Muslims have used this verse to try to say what Jesus means is he has no power in himself. He is merely an agent of God who does the bidding of God. But that's not what the Lord Jesus is saying. He says, I only do what I see the Father doing for whatever he does, the Son does likewise. They are in one accord. They do not act independently from one another. What the Father desires, the Son desires. What the Father wills, the Son wills. And their shared unity is in being. So Jesus can say, I want the disciples to be in unity, one with me as I am with the Father. But they are also one united in mission. Again, we saw that in salvation history, how they're working together. And so that's their their mission together. Redeem humanity. Be glorified. Put an end to evil forever. And so the Father and the Son are co-equal. They are united. And briefly, they are in an intimate relationship with one another. 
Now again, these, we're talking about God, three beings in one. Not only are the three, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, equal, not only are they unified, but they love each other. I guess you could be equal with your spouse in a way. You could be unified in direction of raising your kids, but you don't actually love each other. But what he's saying about the Trinity is that from time eternal, the Father has intimately loved the Son, and the Son has reciprocated that love. Which is why as Christians, we are really, truly the only people who could say our God intrinsically is loving in his very character. He didn't need to create people to be a loving God. He didn't need to make an object to love and to receive love because in himself has been a perfect unity, a perfect intimacy that has always been and always will be. And it says here, too, that Jesus is sharing about this intimacy is as the Son of God, he does not need to learn about the Father. But he has always been with him, as John 1.1 tells us. In this intimate relationship, he doesn't need to get information from angels or from prophets or from apostles. He has firsthand working knowledge because he has always been in this Father-Son intimate relationship. And the Father withholds nothing from his Son in love, but discloses everything. Jesus never has to worry, what is God up to? What's God doing? What's God like? He knows, because he is God, and he is with God. The Son obeys the Father and brings him glory, and the Father loves the Son and shows him all things. And he gives him all things, including the right to decide life and death in salvation and in resurrection. So Jesus has answered their question. What gives you the right to do this? What's your authority? He said, because I'm the son, because I am God. And he goes on to explain as God that he has a unique lordship. We can call him the Lord Jesus Christ because he's our master and that he is Lord over life and death. That he is the Lord over resurrection, over salvation, and that he has been given all judgment. Let's take a moment and think about that and look at this. What does it mean that Jesus has been given all power over life and judgment and resurrection? It says, for the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son, just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Verse 27 tells us, and he, Father God, has given him, Jesus, authority to execute judgment, and he gives us a why, because he is the Son of Man. We try to understand what it means that Jesus is the Son of God in this perfect relationship with the Father. The Son of Man is this term that you come up against again and again in Scripture. And in the Gospels, this is overwhelmingly Jesus' favorite word for himself, his favorite title for himself. He doesn't go around saying that he is the Messiah or that he's the Christ. And he knows all the baggage that comes with those words to his audience. But he prefers to use this word from Daniel, particularly Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. He uses this word called the Son of Man. And packed into that word is that Jesus is the Messiah, that Jesus is fully divine, and that Jesus is fully human. And he chooses this word that he is the Son of God and he is the Son of Man. Because Jesus is both the Son of God and He is the Son of Man, then He is what Daniel had prophesied. He is the eternal world ruler. The Father has given the Son authority to carry out final judgment over every human life. Jesus is the perfect judge the perfect one to have judgment. As John has told us, Jesus knows what's in the heart of mankind. As God, he is omniscient. 
No matter what we say with our lips and we say, I love you, God. I want to follow you, God. He looks right through us into our hearts and knows what's going on. He knows what makes us tick. He knows what motivates us. He knows what we're really like. As fully God, for whom and by whom all things were made, Jesus is a perfect judge of humankind because he designed us, he made us. He knows our hearts. He knows the design of what we were made for, and he knows the results of sin and how far off of that we have become. But Jesus is unique among the three persons of the Trinity in that he alone has taken on humanity. He is the Son of Man who quite literally knows what it's like to walk in our sandals. He knows what it's like to be tempted. He identifies with humanity and that he then is the judge. He is the judge of humankind because the way the world has been established, he is the only savior of this world. And that he came fully revealing who God is, who he is, and what God wants from us. So if we reject him, if we do not listen to his voice, we have spoken judgment on ourselves. The Father has given him all judgment because Jesus is the one who came and died on the cross. To reject that, to turn away from that, is to reject God and no other means of salvation. In that real sense, you have judged and condemned yourself. And Jesus is the standard by which we have life or we have no life. And so that's why we can say he is the judge of all life. Because what we do with him how we respond to him, how we accept his revelation determines our eternity with God or apart from God. It's also why here it says another claim to deity that Jesus is deserving of our honor. Honor here is to esteem, to call him precious, to worship him. That's another bold claim for these people to hear. God has said in the book of Isaiah, I am the Lord, that is my name, I will not give my glory to another. And yet here we read that God was pleased to give all authority to Jesus, and there's a because, so that all will honor him. So that all will turn in fear and wonder and awe at the God-man Jesus Christ and know that he holds their life in his hands. And that they will honor him and worship him. The father's great ambition is for the son to be honored. For him to be glorified. So what do we do? What do you do? When you meet someone who you love, who you respect, who works with you, who's in your house, and they say, I do believe in God. I just don't worship Jesus Christ. I do believe in God. I love him. I know him. I just don't believe Jesus Christ is God. That is where we are. And that's where the world always has been. It's nothing new, brothers and sisters. Western culture is new in that it tells us that we can believe anything we want. And as long as we try hard enough and do well enough, God's going to reward that. God's going to honor that because we, we did our best. Our culture in America tells us that we all worship the same God. We just call him different names. That helps keep the peace. That helps us be friends with each other. But it's not what the Bible says. Our culture tells us we can come to God by any means we choose and that we can reject Jesus and still have God. But Jesus says, clearly, you can't. That no matter what we say with our mouth, no matter what we participate in, even if we're in church every Sunday and open our Bibles, it says you can't have God the Father without God the Son. 
that they are equal. This means that Jesus is much more than just an ambassador for God, but that he is God deserving of our worship and our honor. And that is challenging to our ears. That means that religions, whether they are Judaism, Islam, Baha'i, Jehovah's Witness, Mormons, they consider Jesus to be merely a great prophet or a demigod and do not honor him the way that the Father said to honor him. They are categorically wrong. Not because I say so, but because God has said, here is my son, honor him. If you choose to dishonor him, you dishonor the only real God that there is. And that's where we come to this idea of relationship. This relationship. Jesus has explained his sonship. He's explained his lordship. And he says that this is all revolving around relationship. Relationship. I don't know how many years it's been now. I don't know, it's 10 or 20 years. But it seems in the evangelical Christian community, we have often shared the gospel by telling people, no, 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 it's not a religion. It's a relationship. Have you ever heard that? Have you ever said that? All right. And I think this came from a good place. You know, it came from we wanted to say to people, yeah, maybe you've gone to church Maybe people told you you had to follow all these rules, but that's not really what it's about. It's about, do you really know Jesus? Do you honor him? Do you love him? Have you responded to his voice? Is he your savior? Forget all the stuff. This isn't about works. It's about knowing Jesus, and that is correct. I only think today that we've kind of gone so overboard that it seems just kind of wishy-washy language, and we say we have relationship, but I have a relationship with all kinds of people. What does it really mean? Brothers and sisters, we shouldn't be ashamed. Christianity is a religion. It's a religion. What we believe is a religion. But it's a religion based on relationship with God. A religion, most simply, I think, in my definition, would be absolute claims about life that we make. A worldview. How did we get here? Why am I alive? Where am I going? How do I live? What's ethics? What happens when it's all said and done? Is there a God? If so, what does he want out of me? I think on that definition, really every human being that you and I have ever met has a religion. That's the only way we can function in life. That's the only way we can get up in the morning. Some of us have it more worked out than other people, but we all have religion. What are we here for? Where are we going? Christianity is a religion. It's a competing worldview in the marketplace. The difference is it's a religion that has always been based on a relationship with God. It's no different in the Old Testament and the New Testament. There is a saving God who says, you can know me. And in knowing me, there is life. There is a God who says he has a name and has revealed that to his people. It's a God who says, you can talk with me. There's a God who says, I will walk with you and let myself be known to you. It's a God of revelation. And a God who says you come to him in a relationship of covenant that is based on worship. It is a relationship. And here, what that relationship means in our context, in these verses, is hearing the voice of Jesus. Hearing his voice. This relationship is used in different ways throughout the book of John. It means being born again. It means taking the drink of eternal water. It means eating of the Son of Man. And here it means hearing his voice. There's all kinds of people hearing his voice, but to hear the voice is to welcome him, to believe in him, to trust in his word. And what is his word? Most simply what he's already told us, who he is, why he came that he is God, and that through him there is salvation. And we've seen this throughout the book of John. Jesus' voice is the power that is going out and bringing dead people back to life. That's bringing lost people to be found. That's giving sight to the blind. That is healing people who cannot walk. He's calling out disciples, and they're dropping everything and obeying his voice. They don't know everything about him, but they're obeying 
The official comes and says, heal my son. He's about to die. And he says, go, your son is healed. And the man listens to the voice of Jesus and goes. And it's the voice of Jesus that is healing that sick boy. This is the voice of God, the God who hung the stars by his voice, who created the suns and the planets, ordered our DNA, modeled the world by speaking out his voice, and now he is there in front of real human beings speaking and calling the dead to life. It's the voice of Jesus that's going to call Lazarus out of the tomb. The physically dead are going to lie because they heard Jesus call them by name. And there are the spiritually dead, the woman at the well, Nicodemus, and countless others that hear the voice of Jesus and they respond. Even this, the miracles that they see, the healings, what Thomas later will see, even the cross of Jesus Christ, what is saving us, he has paid our sins, but it takes meaning. It takes belief because we're responding to what he says it means what he says we should do. Jesus died on a cross, but he explained to us what it is by his voice, and by his voice, he calls us to put our faith in him and believe in him. It's his voice that we're responding to, to his word, and that's what he has said. This is great news for us, that Jesus offers the life of God now, in the present. Look at that beautiful language. If you truly, truly, which means amen, 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 I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me, present tense, has eternal life now. Now. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Brothers and sisters, if you have heard the voice of Jesus and you have put your faith in him as the Son of God, Lord over life, What assurance you have eternal life now, today, and no one and nothing can take it from you because it's been given to you by God. Not Satan, not angels, not governments. Nobody can take it from you. And we look forward to the day and we live with hope day by day because not only is Jesus' voice calling out dead people today, But there will be a final judgment by which he will call people out of the grave by his voice. And everyone will go to judgment. And unless we get this confused, this is not what it's saying by works in verse 28. But he is saying those who do good, good means that which is perfect, that which is attributed to God. Those who do that are showing by their fruit that they have believed in Jesus and been transformed. They have fruit because they are connected to the vine. Those who have no fruit, they will be judged because what is proving to Jesus is you have never believed in him. But you have chosen to remain in darkness. And your father is not God, but is the father Satan of this world. As hard as those words are to hear, That's what Jesus is saying, and it's gracious. He's saying this to people that are looking at him and want to kill him, and he's saying, do you know there is a day, it is now here, you can have life, and there's a day coming when it will be too late to answer to my voice. Respond today. If you have heard the voice of Jesus and you know him, our application is to know him more, to know him more to know him as he has chosen to reveal himself. He found it important to explain sonship and lordship, so we need to know it so we can respond. For those of us who have not heard the Jesus' voice, have not turned in trust and obedience, and for people that we dearly love, neighbors and family who do not know Jesus, these are harrowing words that Jesus says. They must be heard as downright frightening. The hour is coming someday, sooner or later, when there will be no time left to respond to our gracious God. That is not to make people afraid and to trick them. That is to graciously tell them the truth. The most loving thing we can do with our neighbors and our families, tell them the truth. There is a day coming, and none of us know when it is. 
And there is great news for today. You can be alive in Christ. You know, we can sometimes look at Jews in the book of John and we can lump them into kind of a character and we should not do that. And we definitely should not read this with any anti-Semitic overtones. When John uses the word Jews in his gospel, he means those who are in authority the religious Jewish leaders. Obviously, John is Jewish. Those people coming out of the darkness are Jewish, and Jesus is Jewish. What are these Jewish leaders? They're men trying to make sense out of life by ignoring life himself, Jesus Christ. They are people like us. The strategies by which the Jews seek to exclude the possibility that the living God himself might be confronting them are no different than people today who ignore God because he confronts us. Being confronted by Jesus, the Son of God, the truth and the light, it confronts us on all of our established worldviews, all of our ideas about what life is about, about my desires, about what I think will make me happy, what I think will make me okay, what will make me complete. It dismantles all my walls that I have put up that say that I'm okay. I can figure this out. I can do this by myself. I know what life is about. When Jesus confronts us and we hear his voice, the voice is calling that we let him determine what life is about and that we respond to him. Jesus is strange to us as he was to people in the first century because he's not like any person we've ever met. He's not like any myth. He's not like any demigod or any angel that any story has ever presented. He is God and he is man. He is a savior who is kind and gentle and he is a judge who has power over our life. Let us respond to that voice.